Discover how to build and scale your business profitability and performance with less time, effort, and cost. Check out efficientpreneur.com. Hi everyone, this is Ahmed Kremli and welcome to Be Efficient TV. The mission of this web TV show is to boost the efficiency of your business and life through tips and tricks from leading experts. And today I have with me Ibo Tira. He's a traveler, a digital strategist, disruptor, and author. He's an expert in startups, uh, media, book pub publishing, and digital marketing. Welcome to the show, Ibo. Thanks, Ahmed, for having me here. I appreciate it. Pleasure to have you. So you, you have a background. You worked in so many different industries and uh, companies. Tell us more about your background, like from publishing, digital media, podcasting, radio. So my life has been a series of taking opportunities as they have, have come to me. And I stumbled into lots of, of various things. I, I accidentally got involved with marketing um, in the, in the mid-2000s prior to that. When the web was first coming online, it seemed like a fun thing to do, and I managed to convince the company that I was working for that I was really good at this internet thing in 1994, when nobody was good at this internet thing. And from there, it led me to get into podcasting, into radio, uh, book publishing, uh, just by following opportunities. As, as I call it, I like to increase my luck surface area, being involved in lots of different things paying attention to trends that are out there and and trying various things to see if they have a if there's a place for me inside of their if I find them interesting and if so I explore and tend to find other people that are interesting uh, and also exploring them that leads to new opportunities and it's it's just one big spiral living your life um, as as an adventure I guess you didn't struggle with the focus and uh, what are you more focused on now <laughs> I, I struggle with focus for the 47 years in existence. Um, I don't, I'm not very good at, at that focus thing. I can get focused in on, on doing one thing, but uh, I'm good for about 20, 30 minutes of focus, and then my mind wanders off to, to other things. But that's always the way that I've been. I've always been interested in a variety uh, of things. I, I'm very much a generalist. I was raised by generalists who, who don't specialize in one skill, and that just works. It's a lot easier to be a generalist today, 2015, than it, than it ever has before. Do you like more the radio industry or podcasting industry, publishing industry, uh, digital marketing industry? Which one you prefer or like more? Um, well, I can talk about the ones that I, I kind of dislike all of them equally, uh, <laughs> which one I like the more. Um, so publishing is in obvious death throes right now as we know it. It, it is changing drastically and has been changing ever since I got involved with it. I always like to get involved when, when disruption is, is really happening. Um, and the same thing goes for radio. You know, it, it's, it's less now about broadcasting from, as they say in the industry, a stick on a mountaintop, and more about digital content distribution. Uh, and, and marketing is, is changing drastically too, which, which is a very good thing because the digital revolution is, is on those things. Podcasting as an industry I don't think actually is an industry, to, to be honest. I think podcasting is, is simply a distribution mechanism for content creation. But all of the things you talked about really roll back into creating content and now it's a matter of how should you distribute that content should you publish it okay should you put it out on the radio whatever radio means in a new digital world where our cars have digital access uh, to, to, to content more than they ever have before uh, does that need some sort of marketing is it in and of itself the marketing you know all of that still remains interesting to me but it remains interesting to me because all of it is changing drastically each and every day in 2014, you quit your position as a VP um, in media and uh, innovation and, and Sitewire and so many other different companies. You just like quit and you focused on the optimistic uh, traveler. Uh, so why mm -hmm. did you do that? This episode is brought to you by the Efficientpreneur Club. The Efficientpreneur Club is a private and affordable one-on-one -on -one business coaching club for business owners and entrepreneurs who want to build and scale their business profitability and performance with less time, effort, and cost, and without risking their freedom. So whether you are still figuring out the right business model, strategy, and pricing, or you need help to improve your funnels, ads, sales, and conversion, then the Efficientpreneur Club is for you. Your business challenges are not going to fix themselves unless you fix them today. 
And the consequences of not addressing that today is your business profitability and performance will not improve and your relationships and health will continue to be affected. It's no wonder that building and scaling a business becomes so stressful over time, but it doesn't have to be that way. The Efficientpreneur Club will help you take your business to the next level with a private and affordable one-on-one -on -one coaching with me personally, tailored to your unique needs. I will help you clarify your direction, set a strategic action plan, and guide you step-by-step -step to build and scale your business efficiently. The Efficientpreneur Club will also provide access to an extensive how-to video library, the most highly recommended tools, and a supportive community of like-minded business owners to help you along the way with feedback, encouragement, and advice. The Efficientpreneur Club is the perfect place to be if you want to maximize your profits, minimize your workload, and scale your freedom and efficiency. So check it out at EfficientPreneurClub.com and say bye-bye to generic courses, secretive gurus, and expensive mentors. Ah, why did we do that? Uh, midlife crisis? No, that's, that's probably not the whole reason to do that. Um, so the short version, because I could talk about it forever, is that my wife and I had been living in Phoenix, Arizona for 18 years and had been trying to leave Phoenix, Arizona for probably five ahead of time. Not that we didn't love it. It was wonderful. But 18 years was a long time for either of us to stay in one place. We were both successful. We were doing everything we wanted. We raised a, a child to adulthood who was out on his own. And we were looking for what's next. What do we want to go for the next part of, of our lives? Not necessarily our careers. We don't think that way. We think of the next step for, for our lives. And uh, a series of things had, had happened, um, one of them which was health-related. Um, doctors were recommending that my wife get out of Arizona. The, the dry, dusty climate was not good for her allergy and asthmas, and so they had been suggesting that we, that we get out for, for some time now. And as we were looking at various places, San Diego, Austin, Texas, um, we had an epiphany in that what if we just took a year at least and traveled the world because San Diego and Austin are nice, but there's a gigantic world out there that we really haven't explored all that much of as, as individuals. Not that we're not well-traveled, but we, we hadn't gone to a lot of places. And since our son was in a good position, um, the companies that I had been working with, Sightwire and Big Bounce, were in the middle of some transition. I spoke with my partners there, and they were very um, amicable to me taking this sort of a quasi-sabbatical for a while and said, yeah, go on and, and do your own things without any promises that when I, if in fact I come back, um, we, I'd be able to get a job again. And in fact, I probably won't come back again because the doctors have said, you don't need to be in Arizona. So we were going to have to change things anyhow. So we decided to make a giant change and sell off everything that we own, literally, and uh, go travel the world for at least a year to see if we could either find some place to call home or could this be home, this idea of nomadic traveling and staying in various places for a period of time and then packing up and moving somewhere else? Is that a lifestyle that, that we enjoy and could we do that um, indefinitely? At that point, like you were what focused on like the site wire, which is what, and your wife, what, what she was doing? And now you yeah. can manage the businesses online? <laughs> Well, so my wife is a, an instructional designer, so her job is to create curriculum for various companies, for training materials and programs, uh, a job that she does typically short-term assignments for various companies. So yes, that's something that she could do uh, online. Uh, I had transitioned out of Sitewire, the advertising agency, to a new offshoot called Big Bounce, where we were focused on providing advice to uh, early stage uh, and, and late stage startups to figure out what their next step is in becoming a successful business. Big Bounce was changing it, the, the nature of what it was doing uh, to, to uh, take on some additional responsibilities that would be less intensive of my time. But for the mentoring of startups and continuing that process, I could very much do all of that on the road. And so a lot of that has continued. So where my involvement used to be 99% 
of, of Big Bounce, the last company I was with, was really all me. That's transitioned to about 5 to 10 percent of the company is me, uh, allowing me to focus and, and, and travel around. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, we didn't want to just simply pack up and be the same exact people we were, do the exact same things. We wanted to give ourselves time to focus on developing this new brand, the Opportunistic Travelers, and finding out if we approach traveling as a startup. Is there a way we could do it and be successful and continue it going forward without, you know, blowing all of our money? But if we blow all of our money, hey, it's just like bootstrapping a startup, right? You, you, if you're successful, great. If you're not successful, then you go back and you, you, you get a job and you do something else. So the mission is to make like a business out of it. Where are you now and which country you are now? I'm in Spain right now. Uh, this is the, the – right now we just entered into our third month of full-time professional, if you will, travel. Uh, we're in Spain for another couple of weeks, uh, and then through the circuitous route, we're going to wind up in Thailand for about three months in, in the end of May. I was talking to uh, one financial expert. I interviewed him in my show. Um, he was saying he, he did that like for one year, and uh, he mm -hmm. was saying that after some time, it will become also, a, you will feel that it becomes also a job because you have side scenes and you have to see them and you go to the hotel and you check in and you check out. So it's three months is still early. You think that you, you might end up in that uh, feeling or? That's always a possibility. You know, anything that you do for enough time professionally, even if it's very, very fun and cool, when it becomes a job, it's a job. Um, so right now, we're trying to do things differently than most travel bloggers. As you, as you mentioned, your friend with the finance, you know, checking in the hotels and you have to write reviews and, and do all of these things. We're trying to avoid that. We're trying to, to build our own individual brands for the content that we create for us and our fans as opposed to being beholden to sponsors or advertisers or having to get to this particular hotel um, and, and do things differently. I'm, I'm drawing heavily on my experience as digital strategist as well as digital content creator to put together new types of content that a large enough audience will actually enjoy uh, building the momentum, if you will, so that we can at that after that our our next step would be find ways to make money along the way, not necessarily having a real clear vision of what the revenue picture looks like today like i 'm not relying on sponsors to come in and pay me a thousand dollars to write blog posts every day that there are people that do that we 're trying something different where the money comes from at this point i don 't really know, but then again that 's also part of being a startup startups that focus on revenue too early tend to fail because they're focused on revenue, not growth. Right now, we're very much in growth stage. And for us, that means content, momentum, and finding additional people who want to hear uh, and read and, and watch the, the content that we're producing uh, as we travel the world. So what's the content in general? What's the nature of the content? Like a, re a review for the places, uh, how you think about digital marketing while you are traveling? Uh, what's the nature yeah. of the content? Right now, the nature of the content is is our experiences and the experiences we have as we are traveling the globe. So we've got a few thousand people right now who are following along, living vicariously through us. There are hundreds of resources where you can go to find the top 10 places, top 10 beaches in Bermuda. There are lots of those out there. So we're not doing that. What we're doing instead is we're visiting places, many places people don't actually visit and are not the primary tourist destinations. And we live our lives almost as locals. We, we try to be very much into the local scene as much as possible so we don't go on the big touristy rides and drives. But along the way, we capture content. We record conversations with locals. We take photos and videos of the areas that are around us. And then we come back at home at night or, or the next day, and we assemble those into discrete pieces of content. For example, every week we put out a, a weekly audio podcast. It's about 10 minutes long that covers the experiences we have had in a particular area. It blends audio storytelling and podcasting and a little bit of journalism all together so you get a nice, concise chunk 
of, of what you're doing. Uh, my wife has been producing these one-minute memories, these uh, videos, if you will, camera, stationary, taking a, a shot. For example, yesterday she did one to where she recorded one minute of what it was like in this uh, plaza area where these kids were, were playing ball in and around the area. And it gives people a glimpse of what it's like to be in the city of Noya, Spain, where we were. And then when we're done in one particular city, we take all the content we've produced, the blog posts, the, the videos, the, the podcast episodes, the restaurants we ate at, the bars we drank at, because there's plenty of drinking at bars where we're doing this, and we put that together and we assemble something called a city guide, which is really an amalgamation of all the content we've created so that if someone does find themselves in Sheffield, England, for example, where we spent two weeks that no one ever travels to, there's a list of the things that you could actually do in Sheffield that are interesting to do. It's not a guide to all things in England. It's not top 10 bars in Sheffield. It's if you want to go and have an experience, at least the experience we had, here it is. Easy way to, to go consume that and live more and like a local. You put it for free, the guide, or for the future maybe you'll sell it? The guide, the guide is free and will probably stay free, um, at least in the format that it is right now. But there's, there's there's a difference between content and container, right? So the content we'll, we'll always put out for free in, in, in that particular container, but I can see us also repurposing that into an ebook form so that's a little more travelable, or perhaps even an app to put down on your phone so before you travel someplace you can download all of our experiences and pay 99 cents for something like that as opposed to having to go to a website. So we, the content will stay free, but I can see how there could be some four fee containers based around that in the future. How long you usually stay in each city and each country? Is there like a plan for that or as you it, get it, bored from the city or you finish it and move <laughs> to another one? Well, it, it is all set up ahead of time because the primary way we're affording to do all of this on it is we, we're using house sitting. So we have an assignment, for example, in, when we were in Sheffield, England, we had 14 days uh, from the time that the people whose house we were staying at would be leaving for their vacation and when they were coming back. So we have to stay there for 14 days because we're responsible for their house and more importantly, the pets that they leave behind as they travel. Uh, where we're at right now in Brion, Spain, a small area in Galicia, we are, we are here until our next commitment, and our next commitment starts on um, May the 18th. There's a conference, I'm speaking at a digital marketing conference in London uh, called the Ungagged Conference, and I'm keynoting there. So I have to be there. So this is kind of a layover, a little vacation uh, that we're taking. But I, and I guess technically I could leave right now, but then again, then I have to pay, pay for airfare and other sorts of things. Right now it's all planned out through the end of September. We've stayed in some places two weeks, and as I mentioned, we'll be in Thailand for three months. So the timing really varies, but it's based less on our, hey, we're bored, let's go somewhere else, uh, as opposed to what's the next destination we have to get to and is there a gap in between for us to fill? And if so, how do we fill it appropriately? So it's, it's, it's just making a puzzle and making everything fit together. Which website do you use or service for this, uh, like finding these places and, you know? We, we use quite a few different um, websites. I think there's about four that we utilize to find our house sitting assignments. We, we've put them all together. We've, if you go to um, theopportunistictravelers.com, um, slash stay for free. We've put together a list of the sites that we actually use um, almost every day. We we check into it every day to see what's new and, and what's upcoming. We haven't done so lately because, again, we're committed until September at one location. Most of the house sitting assignments don't come up more than about three months in advance. So we'll start checking in again sometime in, in June on a much more frequent basis, looking for the, the next step. Because we'd like to get to Vietnam. Uh, we'd like to get down to spend some time in Australia in that area. And the great thing about having all four of the four or five of the websites that we use is they're they're heavily dominated in, in certain areas, like, you know, more Australians use website A as opposed to more English use website B. So we keep our eye on all of those based on where we know we're wanting to go uh, and, and look for the, the assignments that are, that are right for us. Uh, did you really sell everything, literally, in, your, uh, in Phoenix or uh, still the houses there that maybe you use it also for assignments for these websites? Yeah, you know, a lot of people do what you just mentioned, use their own homes and put them up for house sitting assignments. Uh, we opted not to do that, but 
it wasn't necessarily a conscious decision. So we had divested ourselves of real property a, a couple, three years ago in, in Arizona after the housing drop, the significant drop of 2008. We got rid of all the homes that we owned or were, or were underwater on in those particular cases. So we'd been renting for several years. However, we still had a lot of stuff. You know, we had couches and chairs and cars and bicycles and all the things that you accumulate. All of that, well, let's say 99% of that was sold. The only, the only property that we own is now contained in a very small storage unit, which isn't much. It's about a meter square, uh, and most of the stuff in there is our son's. He, he's using it to store you know, his drums and some other equipment and things. Um, beyond that, it's the things that we have in our two suitcases. Each of us have one suitcase uh, that contains the clothes, um, the audio recording equipment, my wife has a separate bag for her camera gear, uh, and that's it. The, the, that is the, the sum possessions of our stuff probably doesn't mass more than 100 kilos total. <laughs> what, did you, what did you learn from this traveling experiences? And uh, is there any hacks or tips that you can share with us regarding traveling, how to plan it, how to, you know, where to stay? Yeah, so traveling, uh, the biggest hack I could tell people to do is lean heavily on your network. I have been building my network either consciously or subconsciously for the last dozen years that I've been an online person. And I have found that my network um, has really stepped in to help us out as we're making these plans. I'll give you two very specific examples on that. One, we were in, we, had, we found ourselves about a five day break between house sitting assignments in Nutsford, England, as opposed to Sheffield, England. They're about 100 miles from, from each other. We had four nights that we really didn't have um, any plans for. So our option was to go get a hotel room. Well, I didn't have to get a hotel room because prior to booking the hotel, one of the people in my network reached out and said, I live in between those two towns. You can come stay at my place for free. The same exact thing happened to us when we were in Belgium. A brand new person that I met online, never had met him before, met him on Facebook the day before he offered us to stay with him four days of a hotel we didn't have to pay for. And right now, I'm staying in Brion, Spain. I'm, I'm staying at the flat of an author friend of mine. I've worked with her for several years on one of my projects. And she maintains a, a, a two different homes, and she's not here for the next couple of months. So she says, you're more than welcome to stay in my, in my flat for free. So I've learned to leverage without you know asking for all of this, more just putting out the word, who's got some place to stay for us. And, and the great thing about that, Ahmed, is I think we have spent, um, in the three months we've traveled, I think we've paid for three nights of a hotel. That's it. Three so, months of travel, and I've paid three nights. So how much on average you're spending per month now, based on the lifestyle that you are living now traveling? So we're trying to keep our, our, our total outlay of cost well under $2,000 a month, which sounds crazy, wow. but we're doing it. Yeah, we're Both. really doing it. So it doesn't take all that much money to have in reserve to, to, do, to yeah. afford to do this for a year. I mean, seriously, if you can amass twenty five, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 in cash and just go burn through it, you can. But the great thing is, is I'm finding opportunities along the way to actually bring in cash. People still need consulting work done for them. We still, people still need the services that my wife and I provide. Uh, and the other great thing is we can afford to be super cheap now. Since we're traveling around, I, I no longer have to charge you know, $300 an hour for consulting. I can charge a lot less uh, than, than anybody else does because my, my bills have gone down to little small amounts. And you didn't think of making this the opportunistic traveler like a tour, uh, uh, like you know, a travel ag agency or something like that on this base, the same basis that you are doing now, and and maybe you take people traveling with you and charge them or like make a retreat yeah. like that or. We we thought about all of those things. Um, you know, we can only implement so many things. Um, at once. We have a couple of friends of ours who do a science retreat. It's a husband and wife team and they take groups of people to various places and he's an astronomer and so they go look at the, the, the beautiful area around there and she's an event planner and so she makes an entire week of it. And we love that model. And so yes, we, we certainly could do some things like that. So we have some ideas percolating and they change 
all the time. Uh, also, the key of being a startup, right? You have to keep pivoting to find out which ones are going to work and which ones make you happy, and then also which ones make you money. But we'll figure that out as we go along. How the concept of uh, donation, money donation works? Like I see you use it in some of your sites. Um, mm -hmm. Can you just explain it to the audience and, and how it works? Yeah, so you know, donations are, are simply that, people who would like to contribute to whatever it is you're doing. So for us on the Opportunistic Travelers, we, we use Patreon, a, a very popular service nowadays where people can become patrons of the content that we are producing. We've kind of turned the model around a little bit and we're giving people something. So for everybody that contributes uh, a small amount of money like $5, 5 euros a month to us, uh, we give them a postcard every single month from wherever we happen to go. And so several people have signed up for that, which, which, which is a nice thing to do. Although we have plenty who have just simply said, no, I don't want a postcard. I just want to provide you some small funds so that you can keep doing what it is that you're doing so I can keep consuming it. And enough people do that en masse, then, then it's an easy way to get there. I started using donations with one of my websites called patiobooks.com. We give away free serialized audiobooks to people. And since we're giving away books, we have the option for some people to, to make a donation, a tip jar, if you will, because they didn't pay for the content. If they really the content really spoke to them, then they can put in some sort of a tip or a donation, if they will, for four bucks a month, four bucks or ten bucks, or I had I had one person last week donate one hundred dollars to one of the authors on, on our website because she was really moved by the content that that author was producing. Um, so we do that. We collect that for people. And as you might imagine, only a very, very small percentage of your listeners, your viewers, your readers will ever donate. I mean, that's, that's just the reality of the situation. So if it's you like make content one, one available, percent, like the conversion percentage? Or? Oh, it's, it's, it's less than 1%. I mean, it's probably half of a percent at, at the highest rate. So, you know, just like anything in life, you have to have lots of people. When you produce free content, you can't produce free and expect everyone to pay you then you shouldn't be doing it for free. You should be actually selling your content. But if you want to produce free content anyhow, because it's what you're going to do, you're going to produce the content anyhow, making an option for some people to come and support it if they so choose, there's no reason to not do something like that. How did you become an author? I became an author, um, like many things in life, by accident. I had been writing for a very long time in, in business. Um, I'm, I've got a gift for gab. The words kind of flow out on the screen for me. And when I got into podcasting very early, um, we, I started podcasting on October the 14th, 2004. So almost 11 years ago was when my first podcast dropped. The podcast I was doing at the time, we interviewed authors, much like you're interviewing me. We would do the exact same thing, my partner and I, except authors were, were our uh, audience. And so when podcasting hit the ground, I contacted some of the authors I'd previously interviewed and told them, there's something here called podcasting that I think is right for you as an author. I don't know what it is yet, but it's, it's a great idea. Well, one of my friends implemented an idea for podcasting, and a few months later, he got a call from his agent saying, would you write a book on podcasting called Podcasting for Dummies? And he called me and said, I've got this great opportunity. And I told him, you should take the opportunity, but there's one problem. T, you don't know anything about podcasting. He said, I know. That's why I need you to be my co-author. So mm. one, but that's how my, my secret was as an existing author was going to write a book he knew nothing about and needed a technical expert on there. And I got co-author credit, and that started the whole process of, of me becoming an uh, actually published author. So the first book was with the, the, the Dummies series, and um, tell us more about the Dummies series, like how it works, like usually they pitch you to, to write based on your expect, uh, expertise a book about something, or you can just pitch them, you tell them, hey, I have this idea, I want to write a book about it, and when you write the book, you have to go by their system, or you just write the content, and then they will edit it based on their system. Right. Um, so it doesn't work that last way. So you can write, you can become a dummies author in, in a couple of different ways. One is they can approach you and usually they approach you through an intermediary. They, they work with various agents who already know talent. So the people at dummies are very smart. So they're looking at the current trends. Um, and so like, you know, I'm pretty sure somebody right now is writing 
Periscope and Meerkat for dummies, the two new you know, real-time video sharing apps that are out there. Someone is writing that because somebody at, uh, at Wiley Press identified those are things that are trends. They reached out to their agents and said, go find me people who are good on this, and, and they're writing it. The other way is that if you have a certain expertise in an area and you see a hole in, in the shelf, on the, on the dummy shelf, you can approach the for dummies people. You can write a, a proposal, and, and they may or may not take you up on that. Once you're selected, regardless of how you got in there, um, you will write it the way the For Dummies people want you to write it. You, do, you are not writing a book for you. You are writing a For Dummies book, and it is very strict, and it is, from, as I understand, very difficult for many authors to adapt to. Now, If you have enjoyed today's episode, I would like to invite you to check out EfficientPreneurClub.com. The EfficientPreneur Club is the right membership for you. If you've been working to grow your business for a while now and things aren't happening as fast as you want. If you are tired of generic courses, secretive gurus, and expensive mentors who charge $2,000 to $5,000 a month then fob you off onto sub-coaches or connect with you in group coaching calls, if you are already stressed out about your business model, sales, productivity, team and systems, if you are scrambling in the evenings and on the weekends and you never have time for yourself and your family, those problems are not going to fix themselves unless you fix them today. Why? Because your business profitability and performance are not going to change unless you do and your relationships and health will continue to be affected. Building and scaling a business becomes so stressful over time but it doesn't have to be that way. The Efficient Preneur Club is a private and affordable one-on-one -on -one business coaching club for business owners and entrepreneurs who want to build and scale their business profitability and performance with less time, effort, and cost, and without risking their freedom. The Efficient Preneur Club will help you take your business to the next level with a private and affordable individual coaching with me personally. I tailor the program to your unique needs. I will help you clarify your direction, set a strategic action plan, and guide you step by step to build and scale your business efficiently. The Efficient Preneur Club will also provide access to an extensive how-to video library, the most highly recommended tools, and a supportive community of like-minded business owners to help you along the way with feedback, encouragement, and advice. The Efficient Preneur Club is the perfect place to be if you want to maximize your profits, minimize your workload, and scale your freedom and efficiency. So check it out at EfficientPreneurClub.com and say bye-bye to generic courses, secretive gurus, and expensive mentors. That wasn't a problem for me because I hadn't published anything before. My, my process was this. We, we got the deal. Um, my co-author and the dummies people went back and forth on what the table of contents would be, which seemed odd to me that you would start a book with a table of contents, but that's how it works in the for dummies world. Settle on what the table of contents would be, and then our job was to write a sample chapter. Not the first chapter. The first chapter is always the last chapter you write in a for dummies book, but each of us had to write a sample chapter and submit that to make sure that we knew what we were doing. So my uh, my partner at the time wrote his chapter because he was on top of things. Uh, I am the world's greatest procrastinator, uh, and I was also a little scared about what was did I did I sign up for something I'm I'm unable to to do this. He submitted his his chapter. Um, about a week later, it came back from the from the people from Berdumis, and they copied me on it, and it was redlined like crazy. Here's all the things they wanted him to change and comments on the side and I and I was just terrified. I mean, my god, this guy has written he's an author. He's written books before and they've destroyed him. So, here was my plan. I I went down to the bookstore and I bought the closest for dummies book I could find. It was um RSS and syndication for dummies, which is a big part of podcasting anyhow. And I took that book and I opened it and I read it cover to cover three times that weekend. And then I sat down with my computer and looked at the, uh, at the outline, picked chapter seven, uh, which was about using FTP to upload your media files or something equally as benign. And I just hammered out a chapter and submitted it. And it came back three days later with three changes. I learned by reading that book mm -hmm. how to write you a for dummies 
book, and I followed their system completely. And the great thing is, is I have continued to follow that system for most of my writing. It, it has made me a much better non-fiction writer. It's, it's rubbish for fiction authors, but I don't write fiction, so that's fine. But my business writing has improved. My email communication has improved. Everything that I have done, I now write almost everything as a dummies author, and it works so much better that way. So if you're going to submit it for dummies book, understand, you will have to change your style to their style. And, it, and, and you're probably better for And how it works, they just pay you advance, or like there is a royalty involved? Yeah, but it is a standard, well, it was for me at least, a standard publishing model to where they issue an advance, uh, and then once the book sells enough of, of copies to pay back that advance, then you make royalties um, after that. So the first book we wrote is now in its second edition, the Podcasting for Dummies, and now there's second edition on that. Well, uh, I still get on a regular basis a, a royalty check from them. It's not a very large royalty check because the book was written, you know, almost ten years ago now. So, but nonetheless, it's still in print and it still sells. And they a few pay ten percent, same system of the regular publishing industry, or royalty. Um, it's it's I. It depends on, on how the book is sold, but it, but it's yes, it's very similar to the to the, the way that it works right there. Because you're paid off of the wholesale price, which is very different today than, than it used to be, right? Because that that's a that's a published book, so you get your ten percent, your twelve percent in some cases. I know that every time one of those books sells, I make eighty five cents. So it, you know whatever the twenty dollar book sells, I make eighty five cents, which which is not a huge amount of money. But you know the new way of doing things in the self published world, digital publishing, where you don't go through a publisher if you don't want it for dummies book and you just want to write your own book about how to do something or your own fiction novel, and you sell the book on Amazon's Kindle program, you get seventy percent of the money, which is significantly greater than eight, ten, or twelve percent by going through a publisher. So things have changed. That, that wasn't an option in 2006 when we got the, the deal to write the for, for Dummies book. So we were happy to take the, the, the paycheck up front and then the small amount of royalties afterwards. And I, and, I, and I wouldn't do it differently then. I would do it differently now, clearly. But, but of course, that world didn't exist in 2006. We'll talk more in details about the publishing and books. But now, mm -hmm. just want to stay with the podcasting. Uh, what do you think about the podcasting industry now? Um, how crowded it is? And don't you think like even the marketers kind of ruining, uh, the, ruining the industry like what they have done with the email marketing and other different stuff? Uh, what's your views about the podcasting now industry? I'm not so sure that there is a podcasting industry. First, uh, at least not that the general public cares about. There may be an internal podcasting industry that, but that only matters to people who continue to call themselves podcasters. I know that uh, the true, the real content producers out there, the serious content producers out there, have have stopped paying as much attention to making a podcast as they are actually making really good quality content. But if I step back and I look at how podcasting the thing, and we can stick with industry if that works, has changed from 2004 when it hit the marketplace to 2015 we are today, it's gone through some cycles. Uh, it's gone through a boom and bust and we're, and we're back in a boom again. But there are two big problems plaguing podcasting. Um, one, probably the biggest one that's out there, is it's still too hard to listen or watch or get. Podcasting still fails the grandma test, as I call it, and it has from day one. The number of steps required to subscribe to a podcast and listen to it are simply too great. And I know it's not that hard. And if anybody listening to your show is right now saying, well, it's not that hard to do. I get it. It's not that hard to do. But it's still not as easy as turning on the radio or the TV where content just throws at you. It's not even easy as going to YouTube where you go to YouTube and videos start playing immediately. It just doesn't work that way. So we failed that test, and I think that's the biggest stumbling block. Now, along with that is the second biggest problem, and that is most of the content is crap. Mm. 
that's because Sturgeon's Law applies in everything, though. I'm not expecting everybody to get good and fine. Most of the content's crap, and most of the content will always be crap because we don't have really good discovery engines to bring the quality content up there. Part of the fault is the podcasters themselves not willing to step up their game and not willing to invest the hours and days it requires to make a real good quality finished product. They want to sit behind the microphone, hit record, and then dump it out five seconds later. I get the appeal of that. I really do. I used to do it. I call that two dorks in a microphone. And that's fine if that's what you want to do. But if you take a look at the top 10 podcasts on iTunes right now, mostly they're not that. They're the type of content that takes real hard editing because people are expecting a certain level of quality that is out there and we can't get away with the crap forever. So even if we fix it so that podcasts are easy to listen to and easy to discover, if we don't have good quality content for someone to listen to, they're going to ignore it and they're going to continue to ignore it. So my appeal to most podcasters is get better. Or perhaps my appeal is to certain podcasters, look in your niche, look in the area of things you want to podcast and be better than everybody else. It's probably not that hard. Most of them, it's like one man show. That's why there is no production team, there is no editing team. That's why the quality is way lower than TV or radio. But like, that's related to the money. Like, how, how for the newbies, how the podcasters make money? What are the different ways to, to make money so, out of them? So, why, why does it matter about the money, Ahmed? To be real, to, I mean, honestly, why, why does the money matter? Let me, let me tell you what I mean by that. Um, so, racing talking about motorcycle racing, car racing, horse racing, I don't really care. The vast majority of people who are car or motorcycle racers, let's look at that one, don't make any money at it. They simply don't. There is no way to become a professional motorcycle racer um, without spending a lot of time, energy, and effort and your own money up front so that you can get good and you get the skills you need to be to actually make money and go through it. Why do podcasters think that it's going to come to them immediately? I produce content, therefore money should flow to me. That's crap. That's not the way that it works. If you're not willing to spend the time, energy, and money to build your brand and to increase your skills, then you're not going to make money. That's life. Those that do, those that are willing to invest, either in themselves, because you don't have to have a production team behind you. You can learn to do this yourself. Or you do actually have to pay someone to do it. Whichever, I don't really care. You will have to do that first. You don't expect money to become flowing to you until you're a pro. Others get lucky, and you might get lucky too. But the better way to do that is invest money to be a pro. And don't expect anything until you've actually been able to prove yourself. If you want money right away, then don't start a podcast. Don't even start a business. Go get a job. That's how you make money right away. Get a paycheck. True. Because it takes time to build the audience, to build, like, uh, most podcasters, they quit after, like, seven, ten podcasts, they quit. Mm -hmm. Because they feel yeah. that there is no point and they're wasting time and they, they are not willing right. to build a platform. Yep. Uh, you wrote a book about Google+, Plus, and I want to ask you why Google+, Plus matters. Right, it's for Google, but still not famous as of, let's say, people don't really use it or engage with it like Facebook or, or Twitter. Maybe I'm wrong, so I want, us, I want you to correct us here. Why yeah, Google well, Plus well, you matters? Are, so <laughs> you, you are wrong. Um, you know, I, I have over a million accounts that are following me on Google Plus right now. I belong to a dozen different communities on Google Plus where fantastic ideas and information are exchanged every single day. Um, is is Google Plus as big as Facebook? Absolutely not. Um, are people sharing the kinds of things on Google Plus they do on Twitter? Absolutely not. It's a very different thing. I think people have uh, this assumption that is if it's not Facebook, then it's not a successful social media platform. And I don't think that's what Google was ever trying to do with Google Plus. Google Plus is, is unlike Facebook. Facebook is a place where you connect with your friends and family. And in fact, you're it's very difficult to connect with someone on Facebook that is not a friend or a family. You have to request friendship with them. That's a very different thing to do. Um, on Google+, Plus, it's more of a place to connect with the people whose ideas you want in your head, or at least in your Google+, Plus stream. So you follow the professionals. You follow whatever it is that you are interested in, and you're building your own I guess echo chamber if you want to think about it that way, but you're building up the kind of content that you actually want to see, not because you happen to go to high school with them in 1986 or you happen to work with them. That's Facebook. 
don't worry about that. On Google Plus, you can build your own network. You can follow the sorts of people that you want to enrich your overall life. That's the secret of, of Google Plus that's different than the other types of networks. You can, yes, you can follow Britney Spears and okay, great, have a good time at doing that. But you can also, like in my case, I follow a huge number of scientists that are interested in space and I find out new information immediately from them. I follow a handful now, I've kind of cut down the number of authors that are on the cutting edge of what it means to be doing digital work uh, these days as an author. And I'm just getting into understanding the, the people who are professional travelers that are using Google Plus to make connections and build up communities to really change the way this idea of travel blogging is working. It's a wonderful mechanism for that and I never have to worry about pictures of my nieces and nephews throwing up in my stream. That's but, for Facebook. But how different is that from liking a fan page on Facebook? Also, you will follow experts and things. Is it the people on Google Plus are different or the type of experts are different? It's like like some people, like let's say Instagram is for more for young younger people than Facebook, maybe because some of the kids, they don't want to be on the same platform with their parents. How different Google Plus uh, with Twitter and um, uh, Facebook in that regards? Well, the problem with a, with a Facebook fan page is you have to find it. You know, you, you have to actually assume that, that there is that whatever that, that business page is doing is actually producing content to there. And in many cases, it's, it's not. I mean, if I want to follow a podcast on Facebook, I, I certainly could do that one. But, but Facebook is really no good for discovery. Uh, it's just not, not a great discovery tool. It's more of an instant, you know, people talking back and forth tool. And of course, there's a certain aspect of, of people that are talking back and forth on, on Google+, people who are using it just like Facebook, people who are using it just like Twitter. But those are the people that aren't getting the true value um, out of the content. Yes, there's a different type of people that are there. I, I would not have an option, for example. I probably follow 500 different scientists on Google+. That would not be possible for me to do on Facebook because most of the scientists do not have their own Facebook uh, brand page. They probably have a Facebook profile, but that's where they share personal information. That's not happening um, over there. But also, I'm, I'm pretty deeply involved in the craft beer community uh, on Facebook, or excuse me, on Google+. Again, there, there are various places. I can find out the events through Facebook, but I can find out more of the inner workings of the industry over on Google+, Plus because people are more likely to share longer form content and interesting things there. It really all depends on, on your mindset. If you're, if you're looking at it from a marketer perspective and you say, where's the biggest audience? Then you think, well, Facebook clearly. But I think marketers, and the reason I wrote the book on Google+, Plus, which was for authors specifically, is think about Google+, Plus because maybe it doesn't have a million people, that's okay. You're not going to reach a million people anyhow. If you can reach hundreds or hundreds of thousands or even millions, which is what Google Plus actually has with your message, that's a large enough audience. It should not be ignored just because it's not as big as Facebook. It's not Facebook. It's not Twitter. It's not even Instagram. It's none of those things. It's a different beast on, on its own. Now, of course, in, in recent months, Google has been making uh, you know, less and less of noise about Google+. Plus, and I, too, like anybody else out there, wonders what's going to happen with Google+. Plus, and I worry a bit that it's, that it's lost its way. I, I get that. Um, but that's okay. We shouldn't be putting all of our eggs into one basket anyhow. I don't worry too much about Google+, Plus, like I don't worry about Facebook when it changes its layout or when it changes its algorithm so that only 10% of the brand pages, the things are in there. That's the nature of the beast, marketers. Just deal with it. Make sure your content gets spread in, in lots of different places, but in appropriate ways, and just adapt to the, to the way it's working over there. They they're, they're always have their own best interest in mind. You just have to be smart and roll with those punches. How to make a killer Google Plus uh, profile and um, mm -hmm. what's the approach of, to using Google Plus that you recommend for the newbies? Yeah, so specifically to the book that I wrote, um, killer, killer Google Plus Profiles or whatever the title was, I've already forgotten right now, um, it, was, it was really teaching, trying to teach people 
how to be a little different on Google Plus and how to not just do it like Facebook. And that really starts with a with a with a profile. Um, that's the that's the key thing that I think authors can do differently on Google Plus than they can on Facebook. Where on Facebook you might want a, a fan page, if you will, uh, to be less than personal. You don't want that on Google Plus. You want to be an author. You want to be the person you want to do. Um, and so the the book is really all about optimizing not the content that you produce on a regular basis. We talk a little bit about that, but just getting your profile set up properly so that you look like a professional, that you look like an expert. It's, it's amazing how many times I go to somebody's page on Google Plus who writes a brilliant post. They write something that's fantastic that finds its way through me because that's what Google actually does. And I go, I would like more info. And I click on their about page, nothing. It's blank. And it's just a horrible. Or I'll follow a link from somebody who's bad mouthing Google Plus somewhere else and go, well, let's see what they're doing on Google Plus. And there's and they're not doing anything. They haven't really given it truly a chance. So the book, and it's only like eight thousand words, it's a very, very small amount of time to actually read it. And it's geared specifically towards authors, but really anybody could get to adapt, any professional could adapt that one. It walks you through the process of getting everything done right. So that when you finally do jump in and start engaging on Google Plus and finding the communities you want to be in, when somebody says, hmm, you look interesting. Let's go find out if you're more than just the post that you wrote. There, the answer is yes, you are. And here's where the rest of your content, here's where I can find everything else about you where I'm not all pigeonholed in one space. That's the secret of Google Plus. Getting yourself, make yourself look right, write good content and success can follow you. You use Twitter and Facebook and Google Plus and uh, mm -hmm. how do you use each of them for yourself? Well, I, so I'm an early adopter. So I was one of the first people on Twitter. I was on Facebook as soon as you didn't have to have a .edu um, and I was on Google Plus from, from day one. Uh, the same thing with Instagram and, and a bunch of other ones. My, the, what I have realized over using these platforms for the last eight years or so is that each one of them is different, um, and yet each one of them is, is very similar to one another, right? I mean, the idea behind a social network is to get out there and be social uh, and, and do social things in there. But you really have to conform to the norm of the network itself. I have vacillated back and forth on how I use each one of those tools. When I first got on Twitter, I was one of the people who would automatically follow everybody back. That was a stupid decision, and I no longer I no longer do that because it makes Twitter less meaningful to me. Today, I use Twitter probably less than any of the other networks that I have out there. Um, it's it's just I guess I'll say too fast. There's just too much information coming too quickly for me, and there's not enough content and meat. I've recently been researching my efforts over on Facebook because we did build a a page, a business page, a fan page for the opportunistic travelers, my, my new content, because a lot of people that are listening to it are on Facebook and have asked me to start putting out content over there as well. So we've been doing that. And of course, native video is huge in Facebook these days. So we're finding a pretty nice audience for the video content we produce as the opportunistic travelers on Facebook, more so even than YouTube. Um, so lots of content goes out there. But we also utilize YouTube uh, I use Instagram real heavily as, as part of uh, the, my journeys here as the, as the optimistic traveler. And my wife's really started getting us involved with Pinterest, an, an, another platform that exists out there. But they're all different and subtle. We have to do the right kinds of things in each one of them. And it used to be our goal, or most people's goal, was to use those social networks to drive traffic to your website. And that's, the, that's not the right approach. Uh, the right approach is to use those platforms to drive eyeballs and people consuming your content and recognize the fact that you are more than just your website or a single web page or your social network. Uh, it's, it, to us, it is really about just getting people involved with our brand in all of those places. And that seems to be what Google wants anyhow with their, their latest algorithm change that happened just a few days ago. Uh, it's less about driving traffic to a web page and more about making sure that people can consume your content on whatever device they happen to be holding in their hands at the moment. So that's what we're trying to adapt and change to. Put the kind of content in the kinds of places that people want to, to use and consume. How did you get into the radio industry? 
I got into radio um, another by accident, oddly enough. My um, my wife and a friend of hers uh, were chatting one day, and I, I met I met the husband, and he was an author, and he had just started this online radio show. And I was in a band at the time, and I and I went on the program to to plug the band that I was with, and found out that I liked radio. I hadn't done radio since I was in college, or had been behind the microphone since my audio production days back, you know, several years before that. Came on his show, loved it, um, and he said, "You want to come back again next week?" And next thing I knew, I was a co-host. And the good thing about having him as a partner is that he he had no idea how terrible we were. And so he had no problems picking up the phone and talking to different program directors from uh, radio stations around the country in, in America where I was from and even XM Satellite Radio and convincing them to take our show and syndicate it. That led to us getting on XM Satellite Radio. That led to a two years we were, on a, we were a live show on the number one talk radio show in the southwestern parts of the United States of America. It, it just kind of spiraled because he was tenacious and we were putting out a, a good enough content. We learned along the way. We made lots and lots of mistakes to where we, we jumped into the, the radio business. And uh, it just sort of happened. Everything, like most things in my life, an accident that was that was a fun experiment they keep trying for a while how to distribute a radio or a podcast nowadays to the mm. satellite radio satellite is it the same or it, people don't care about satellite they just go to the internet and see iTunes or Stitcher or well there's yeah there, there are some people that still care about, about satellite radio I mean there's still radio that's Sirius XM or XM Sirius whatever it's called these days and still is installed in lots of, of different cars and so there are a couple of different ways that you can you can get up there the way we did it is we just we just called them directly we contacted uh, uh, XM Satellite and basically badgered them to, to put our, our show on. I don't know if that technique still works today or not. But the nature of distribution is really changing. We're probably five years away, and I know everybody says five years, and what does five years actually mean? Five years away from digital streaming into cars becoming a, a reality. There's a company called AHA. Uh, right now they're a part of Harman. And they're doing in-car audio distribution with, with content today, digital streams that are in on the dashboard. They've been doing it for the last two years, and two years ago I said five years, and I'm, I'm still saying five more years before it actually becomes out there. Um, and there are a lot of new platforms that crop up every day that are distributing content through RSS feeds and discovering. Um, my advice to any person, specifically who are podcasting right now, is it's, it needs to be less about getting people to come to your website, as, as I mentioned earlier. So yes, distribute your podcast on iTunes. Yes to Stitcher. And yes to Spreaker and the other 200 places that are out there that are holding your content. Because you never know where somebody might discover your content. It makes no sense to, to, to say, I'm not putting my content on there, or 90% of my downloads come from iTunes, so that's all I'm going to get. Well, 90% is a good number, but why not go for 100? If it's not, if it doesn't take any extra work other than some initial upfront work to get your stuff out there, do that. Distribute in as many places as possible and just put out good content that's got good branding inside of it and you're, you're doing what you need to do, putting your words out there. People will figure out how to get more of you, but just let them get more of you, that whatever way is, is possible. Less, less, less worry about come to my feed, subscribe to my show on my website and all that stuff. Less about my. The my is your content. Let the content go. Let it be free and uh, good things will happen to you after that. So what is Podio Books and uh, how it works? How did you come up with it? And it's also about free content. Yeah, podiobooks.com, free serialized audiobooks distributed in podcast form. I mentioned earlier that my uh, my writing partner T. Morris on the on the For Dummies book, I, I had called a whole bunch of authors and said, "There's this cool podcasting thing. You should get into it." So T. was one of the first ones to jump on and say, "I think I've got the solution. I think I'm going to just narrate the book that I wrote three years ago and release it every week as a podcast episode. What do you think?" And I said, "That's brilliant." We should do that. And then that same week, I got a call from four other authors who said basically the exact same thing. So then I knew there was something to this idea of making audiobooks serialized in podcast form, but it needed a few things. One was a name, and so I came up with the name Podiobooks, which is a, obviously a blend of podcasting and audiobooks, Podiobooks. And I knew it needed a home. 
So I did one of the things that I do pretty well, and that's beg people to give me free stuff. And I managed to cobble together a website because the developer was kind enough to donate his time. Um, I worked out a deal with the guys at Liberated Syndication, Libsyn, who's still the number one podcast media host today, to provide the hosting for this. And my thing to do would be donate whatever money necessary to get things off the ground, like paying for servers, um, and then also just continuing to maintain it, which I've done for the last, you know, 10 years uh, with the help of lots of other really smart and talented people. So today we have uh, 700 audiobooks, all of which are available for free, most of which are narrated by the author. A few have actually found other people to do some narration for them. Um, and you can subscribe to them like you subscribe to any podcast, or you can just go visit the books page and click and play. We just released a new audio player on the site, which now works so much better. Um, so now you just go through and just begin listening to a book and enjoy. And it's totally and completely free. If you feel like donating to uh, our authors, great, please do so. We pass along 75% of the donations along to the author, and we keep the 25% to, to pay for the server and the other fees because there are some fees. That, that go along with keeping the whole thing running. Um, it's working pretty well. We, last month, we generated a little over 2.5 million downloads of the episodes of our book. So uh, I'd call that pretty successful. So is it a platform? Uh, like, what's the mission behind that? Is it a platform like iTunes? And what's the long-term vision uh, for it, or is it like affected now by the uh, Audible? However, it's more most of it's paid. How mm -hmm. do you see that? So the audiobook industry has changed. When we first started audiobooks.com, there your only option as an independent author. Most of the books on our site are written by independent authors. So if you're going to the site looking for Harry Potter, you won't find it. You'll find a lot of good books that are similar to Harry Potter if you like YA fantasy, knock yourself out. Um, but for independent authors, they really didn't have much of an option in 2005 when, when the website started. You could either write your book and hope a publisher would pay you some amount of money to publish it, Good luck. Most books didn't get on that way. Or you could use what we called Vanity Press at the time. There were a series of many different predatory publishers, if you will, who for a fee would produce your book for you, put it into a paperback form, and then send you a box for the low, low price of something like $15 a book. Terrible, terrible idea. And then it was up to you to go through and sell those. There really weren't ebooks. And the only way you could get a book into audio was to actually have the book into print ahead of time, and which you didn't have. So it was a very difficult thing to, for, for independent authors. It really wasn't an easy way to break into it. So when we started, basically we told authors, all you have to do is put in the time. Sit behind your microphone, record your audio book, make it meet some minimum technical specifications, which are easy to do so, and we will distribute your book for you and you will build an audience. So lots of people did. It was hard, but a lot of people actually did that one. Well, now we live in a world of Amazon Kindle, which didn't exist when we started at audiobooks.com. There wasn't an option. Ebooks existed. They were out there, but nobody was reading them because we didn't have a Kindle. And ebooks were terribly expensive in 2006. Well, everybody knows today ebooks are one of two prices. They're free or they're 99 cents. Ebooks have really lowered the overall price of that. So now it's a lot easier for authors to get distribution. Uh, any, but any author can. You can write a book, and as long as it fits technical specifications, Amazon will publish it for you on Kindle, which is the same approach we take with PatioBooks.com. It's a lot easier to publish on Kindle because you don't have to actually narrate a book. You just make it into an ebook, and and it is done. So yeah, our our business has changed over time. Our interest level from new authors has has receded since it's so much easier to get out there, but. Enough authors have found success, some of them quite wonderful success, by using primarily our site as a platform to reach new readers that they continue to do it every day. Uh, and I still produce, put up one, maybe, maybe two or three books every month from brand new people that want to use our site to help them reach new people. That was the goal initially of audiobooks.com. Put your content out there in a format that not every other author is doing, and that's still up there today. And you'll find a new audience, and some of that audience will then come back to you and, and buy your ebooks, buy your print books, or maybe even buy the audiobook version 
uh, that's professionally produced and is placed up on Amazon or placed up on Audible. We still play a role in that overall scheme of things. Um, and we're also looking for the future of how can we leverage the 700 pieces of material we have right now to do further distribution and content. So we've got a few plays uh, in the works on how we can do more of that. Uh, it, it really all depends on what the next year or so holds as how audiobooks are transformed uh, by, by some new technologies that are coming on that make it a lot easier to record than, than ever before. So we're, we're, we're watching with some trepidation to see what the future holds. But for now, we're going to continue producing audiobooks and giving it away for free. And you never thought of or approached by companies who do ads? Let's say if you have 2.5 million downloads a month, uh, you can just make the system that one ad will appear on all the books when you play it mm -hmm. or something like that. You thought about yeah. it or you just want to keep it free like this and just be, depend on donation? So we, we not only have thought about it, we do it uh, on occasion. But here's the problem. As great as it sounds for 2.5 million downloads a month, that's a really, really, really small number when it comes to branded advertising. It's just not that many. Advertising is sold on a cost per thousand, and at, at the rate of around $10 cost per thousand, it's just not a lot of money. Not only not a lot of money for us, but it's not a lot of money for an advertiser to really take seriously because it takes work to put together an ad that would run across all of our books or even a subset of our books. And it's just not a large enough piece that people get terribly excited about right now. We've done it. We have some ads running right now. Sometimes they, they're moderately successful, but sometimes they're, they're not so much. Um, I would love to, to talk with someone who's a little more forward thinking because all too many of them are follow, you know, go to this website and use this promo code. And it's that's just the wrong the wrong idea you know the the wrong the wrong approach to take. We need someone thinking about it differently to uh, to work with us, and uh, and that's been hard hard to get because radio and TV exists, uh, or they could just run it run an ad across fourteen different podcasts that each have a million downloads a month and, and get twice the audience. And we're really the only place that does books. No one has found a successful way to advertise inside of books just yet. I'd love to find somebody to play that game and find out if we can. Right now they, they they're not out there and we've looked. Um, how do you write efficiently? What's your routine? I write in the mornings um, and I, I try to write undistracted. So I, um, I'm a big fan of using either Google Docs uh, or using light paper as my writing tools when I'm, when I'm doing free form writing. That, that works pretty well. I typically write from an outline. Uh, I use a tool uh, that's called Workflowy. I had to think of the name for a moment. Workflowy.com. It's a free online outlining tool. I'm a huge fan of using outliners. Uh, I use them as I put together my presentations uh, and even all of my books. Everything is really well outlined from the beginning. And that it allows me to just simply grab a section and write that section, not necessarily in order with everything else. But if I feel compelled to write Chapter 7 again, I can, I can begin on that process. And, and even with that, one individual paragraph or section within Chapter 7 keeps me – it keeps my – brain that kind of fumbles around, um, it allows it to do that without having to be linear because sometimes I get too linear and I, and I, and I lose my, my train of thought. How to write a proper sales and marketing copy for a book and what is a sales and marketing copy for a book? You wrote a book about that. Yeah, I wrote a book called Writing Awesome Book Blurbs, which is really all about writing the description that goes on the book. So here's the reality. Your friend tells you about a wonderful new book by someone you've never heard of. Okay, great. You go to Amazon.com because that's where you go to check out new books and you, you find that book. Because it was a personal recommendation from a friend and he really liked it, you're probably going to buy it regardless of what the, it says. As long as the cover looks good to you and the price is right, your friend liked it, I'm going to buy that book. But quite often, people will stumble across and discover books because of the people who read this also like feature on Amazon, or they're looking for a particular topic, especially in the world of nonfiction. You know, I would like to find a book on travel blogging, for example. I'm going to go to Amazon, and I'm going to be flooded with lots of content. The sales copy, the book blurb, that paragraph or two of text that accompanies the cover is critical to getting somebody to buy it. Two most important factors, have a good looking cover and also have a book blurb that actually works. You will be amazed at how many book blurbs 
have almost no description of what they are, or they're just a, a rundown of the table of contents, not really helpful. Or they are full of spelling errors and other sorts of oddities that just make you cringe thinking if this is how horrible the, the blurb itself is written, how bad must the book be? And the secret is this. Most authors, almost every author I know, hates writing a book blurb. They just hate it. So, so what is a <laughs> book most blurb? It, it comes with it. the book, like separately, or it, it's a part of the book? or. So when you go to Amazon.com, and you get to a one book page, and you see a big picture of the book, below that, when you see the description, mm -hmm. right? That's the book blurb. That's the part that has to sell the book. It doesn't necessarily go inside of the book. It goes on the Amazon page, on the sales page. It's the sales copy. So for, the, digi that for the digital use, mainly. For the digital, it's not for the hard copy books. For the platforms where you put your book digitally, whether it's an ebook or uh, hard, uh, I mean, hard copy on Amazon. It is for the digital marketplaces where most books are bought today. It is for the digital marketplaces, whether it's Amazon.com, whether it's Kobo, whether it's Barnes & Noble, all of those sites where the vast majority of books are bought today are bought from an online retailer. Uh, that's what you have. You want to make sure you write a good, compelling copy, sales copy for your book so that somebody who discovers it might actually buy it. Uh, publishing or self-publishing, which one would you choose if you have both options? No difference. Um, but I think what you meant to say was, would I go through a traditional publisher or would I self-publish my next book? Um, I, would, I would do a hybrid model in the perfect world. Um, if, it's an, if I'm selling an ebook, I'm selling an ebook, and I'm selling it as me because 70% is much better than 10%, right? So I'm going to be selling my own ebook. However, I probably would still go through a publisher if I was interested and if my book was successful enough in, some, in, in paper distribution, whether hard copy or in print, because it's still better to have your book uh, in print inside of a, of a bookstore. Uh, as opposed to having a special order that they have to make. There are options. I can get it in there. Publishers have a much easier w chance of getting books in a bookstore, where still a lot of books are actually sold. So perfect world, publish the ebook on your own, or and, not or, and have a publisher work with you to actually get the, the print rights to, to doing that one. But I do the audio on my own as well. I take care of all my own uh, international. I wouldn't, I wouldn't take any of the rest of that from them. Uh, it's, it's complicated, this, this world of publishing. So the easiest answer is, Almost always publish it yourself unless somebody wants to pay you a ridiculous sum of money. And that means that doesn't mean five hundred dollars. Doesn't even mean five thousand dollars. That means probably an order of magnitude more than that. If they're willing to pay you that kind of money, then take the publishing deal. Uh, if not, you're almost always better doing it yourself. Top three favorite books. Oh my gosh. Top three favorite books of all time. Oh man. Uh I, uh, I read books and th so quickly, it's, it's, it's not even funny. So right now in my, and, and of course I got rid of most of them. So the books that I actually saved and I put in storage, one of them is called A Candle in the Dark, and it's written by Carl Sagan. I definitely recommend everybody picking up that. Um, that is in there. There, uh, a book that a friend of mine recent, well not recently, probably about five years ago wrote, um, uh, is called Death from the Skies. And it's all about ways that the world actually might end, which is quite compelling. His name is Phil Plate. Uh, and he's an astrophysicist, and he wrote uh, about that as well. Um, and my third favorite book is a piece of fiction called The Road by Cormac McCarthy. And it probably is the most um, – the book I could never put down. I believe I read it complete in one sitting without even sleeping because it was such such a compelling wonderful book the movie was utter shite but the book was was wonderful top three mentors uh, or people that top, you're inspired by i'm inspired inspired by some of the of the greats that are out there um you know the people like uh albert einstein is a is a huge uh in, in, a force in my life. Let's keep doing things. Uh, Carl Sagan, continue to drive forward and go on. Um, and then the, my my bigger inspiration, in all that is my my lovely wife Sheila. She keeps me going forward every single day to make sure these things actually work that we're doing. Last question: How people can contact you? 
Well, I'm kind of everywhere. So if you go, to, if you just search for Evo Terra, uh, it's me everywhere. If you want to see the latest and greatest of our travels as we're going around the world, go to the opportunistic travelers dot com, uh, and you can catch up with all of us uh, there. All great stuff. Thank you so much for your time and this journey of traveling with you. I uh, really appreciate it. You're very welcome, and thanks for having me on the show. Thanks, everyone. Be efficient and stay efficient, and see you soon with another leading expert. Thanks for watching or listening. It means the world to me if you would leave an honest review of the show on iTunes or any other podcast platform that you are listening through. And big thanks to all the people who have already reviewed the show. Discover how to build and scale your business profitability and performance with less time, effort, and cost. Check out efficientpreneur.com.